There are many business families in the world of Indian industry who can claim a history that goes back a long way, who can claim to be inheritors of old money, but not many who can claim an ancestry that goes back to Mughal times. The Lal Bhais of Ahmedabad are probably the only industrial family who can claim an ancestor who was a jeweler in the Mughal courts and who is believed to have collected some jewels that found their way into the peacock throne. This is in 1570 or something round about that. And uh, he was the first Nagar Sheth and then uh, we, I am the twelfth in the line. Nagar Sheth's family is another family, but we are the descendants of the Nagar Sheth. The most prominent uh, person in the entire hierarchy was Shantidas Sheth and that was in the 17th century and he was the jeweler in the court of Jahangir and Shah Jahan and he was a very prominent industrialist at that point of time. He was not only known for his entrepreneurship but uh, I think the social responsibility, the way he built or donated to social causes really brought him as a you know, very prominent personality in, in his time. As the story goes, you know, whether it is true or not, I don't know. But uh, a gem was to be identified and he was the only one who could identify and, identify and really price it. So Akbar was very impressed and he became the one of the jewelers of the kingdom. Jashri, were you always aware of the legacy of this family that you married into? Actually not. When I got married, I mean, I knew that they were a business house and my family knew this family very well. Mm. But personally, I didn't. And uh, the first thing Sanjay's grandfather told me was that um, he gave me a little booklet and he asked me to read through it. And he says, remember, I'm going to ask you some questions on it. He was very proud of his legacy and he really felt that we should know the kind of family we are come from. And what was the booklet about? It was the life of Shantida Sheth, our uh, ancestor who was, uh, you know, one of our most uh, celebrated people even then. Mm. Uh, many historians have noted his uh, contribution in the social life of Ahmedabad. Mm -hmm. uh, he, not only was he a jeweler, but he wielded a lot of influence there. Mm. It is evident in all the farmans and things that the Mughals uh, bestowed upon the family. Yeah. There's a very unusual story, very, uh, I mean, it belies Aurangzeb's nature, but uh, our family had lent money to Dara Shukho, who eventually was thrown off by Aurangzeb. And when Aurangzeb became emperor, Shantidash traveled on horseback right from Ahmedabad to Delhi to ask for his monies back. And Aurangzeb's relationship with the family was a little stormy in the sense when he was Subedar here, he had taken over the Chintamani temple. And on uh, Shantidas's request to Shah Jahan, Shah Jahan made him return the temple back to the Jains. The Jains, of course, didn't take it back because they felt it was desecrated. But that was the influence Shantidas had at the Mughal court. And when he had been ordered to do, undo one of his wrongs. In spite of that, Aurangzeb returns the money. The Lalbhai family still has among its cherished possessions farmans from Mughal emperors lending their support to the family in its efforts to preserve ancient Jain temples and endowing it with wealth and properties. By the second decade of the 17th century, Shanti Das, the oldest known ancestor of the Lalbhai family, was already a very rich man. Shantidas died in 1659, but the family fortune continued to grow enough for one of his descendants, Khushal Chand, to hold off a Maratha raid on Ahmedabad by paying the invaders five lakh rupees out of his personal wealth. When uh, Surat was uh, ransacked by the Marathas, the news came here and the business community got together and approached Vakhat Chanshet and said, 
something should be done otherwise we will all be ruined. And so he immediately sent 5 lakhs of rupees at, at, at that time with a delegation to the uh, Peshwas that if you would go back we would hand over this money and that money was handed over and they went back. Ahmedabad was non, not transacted. In modern times, the tallest member of the family has been Kastur Bhai Lal Bhai, who's remembered in the annals of commerce as a businessman who not only built a textile empire, but who went beyond that to give back to society much more than most other businessmen can do in a single lifetime. He was a wonderful person. Uh, you know, right from our nuggets, our forefathers, in our family it has come that you should try to be prosperous, but you should always keep in mind the people, needs of the people and work with them and work for them. Kasturbhai Lalbhai's father's sudden death meant that he had to give up college and take charge of the family business, which then consisted of a couple of ailing textile mills. It was he who built from this an empire consisting of seven textile mills, a starch unit and India's first dyes factory in Atul. Behind me at the bottom of that hill over there is the Atul chemical plant, which was the earliest dyeing plant built in India. It was inaugurated in 1952 by Jawaharlal Nehru and again Kastur Bhai Lal Bhai fulfilled the kind of uh, or did a first. He was planning to originally build a factory in Bombay and was invited to come here by Muraji Desai. And they say, family law has it, that when he saw the land and the river, he realized that this was inviting him to come here. So he didn't go to Bombay, he came here. And Atul being here has transformed what was a very backward area into an almost urban one. This was started, I think, in '52, when Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru opened and did the inauguration ceremony. I was not there. I came into the family in '59. But prior to '52, I think my father-in-law and Mr. Mazumdar, he was our manager, and one from Ms. Cyanamide, they all went all over India to find out which is the best place for a dye factory because they require a lot of water, they wanted a lot of uh, land. Mm. Finally they decided on this and I remember my father-in-law telling me, I at once decided on this spot because our jameen hasti se. This land is laughing, is smiling, so I think I should buy this land for the factory. And this was that time a completely rural area. There is nothing like national highway. And I was told then that the robberies were taking place across the river. Did you have a sense of legacy that you... Oh, did? certainly. Certainly. Yeah? My grandfather in particular uh, has been a, uh, a living legend for us. He was a very, very self-disciplined person. He lived a very uh, simple life. He spent very little on himself, but uh, did a lot for the society. He had a sense of social purpose and uh, a man, as a man, he was very, very principled. He was also a visionary, but he was at the same time a man of details. And he lived a very principled life, and uh, he has left a lasting impression on all of us.
The Atul factory is surrounded by so many trees planted by Kasur Bhai Lal Bhai and his heirs that exotic birds come here to nest and breed, making it look like a factory in a bird sanctuary. And this beautiful place that, uh, that he's built over here, uh, that was, was it like this when he built it or has it grown since then? Complex used to look like this even 25 years ago, hmm. except that we have added some new manufacturing facilities. But other than that, the complex is fairly similar. We have added a school. Hmm. Basically, we have added a few houses, hmm. uh, essentially preserved the way it used to hmm. uh, be. But Kasturba's business methods cannot survive modern competition. His uh, uh, idea was to create employment on a very large scale. Hmm. He wanted to create wealth for the society. Uh, he was very keen that India be made self-reliant. Hmm. And it was with this uh, uh, ambition and dream that he started this company. And uh, currently what we are trying to do is to make sure that we remain very, very competitive. Uh, that time we put up several products for import substitution. Now we need to, uh, uh, to go for uh, products which are global size. Uh, and therefore we have to make uh, certain changes. And a lot of my time currently is going in uh, uh, making those things happen, mm -hmm. you know. My father knew Gandhiji very well. So he took me to Gandhiji when I went to Delhi. And I used to attend Gandhiji's prayers every evening. And I think that little influence now I feel may have played my part in making me stay here. A two rural development was started by my husband also. And uh, we were doing a lot of and we are still doing a lot of eye camps, lots and lots of eye camps. Then we used to do little hut building in one area. And supposing there's some crisis of water, then the company will send them water with the pipeline, everything. So when did the change start to happen in their life? What is happening, the most tribal people, they are also getting advanced. They have got two wheelers. Thank God that they can also come to the places they can travel. And one person always told, traveling is progress. Kasturbhai Lalbhai is a man the city of Ahmedabad owes much to. It was he who helped build some of its finest educational institutions and the tradition of community responsibility is something his heirs continue to hold dear. Every educational institute that you will see is housed on the land that was procured by Dharaji. You see, uh, Ahmedabad Education Society was a, uh, a trust that was formed and LD Engineering, School of Pharmacy, uh, SEPT, all these institutions. Indian Institute of Management. Is Indian, yes, but that's not part of the Ahmedabad Education Society, but Dharaji was instrumental in getting IIM to Ahmedabad along with Vikram Bhai. Vikram Bhai and Dadaji brought a very many good institutes to Ahmedabad. Because he comes from my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother, my mother and other ladies of the family, to see at the gate if any poor person is there, he should not go hungry. So right from beginning, 
there is a tradition in the family to see that we serve the society as best as possible. Kasturbhai Bhai is credited with having said, in business there is no replacement for ethics. It is a creed that his heirs have stood by through hard times. You know, when Dadaji passed away, every company was profitable. Mm, Arvind had never missed dividend in, from 1931 to 1980. So they were very, quite prosperous companies. But the first signs of problems uh, from power looms was almost on the horizon. So the troubles were to start. In the 80s, Ahmedabad's textile industry, which consisted then of more than 60 mills, collapsed because it could no longer compete with power looms in the unorganized sector. We were in the license raj. So we were in the organized sector. We were constrained by a license, so we were not allowed to expand. And power looms could mushroom because they were the unorganized sector. They grew without any kind of permission and they had the labor flexibility. They were also on the wrong side of taxation. So with all those advantages, I think they really posed a major challenge. And because they grew very rapidly and they gave employment to a number of workmen, finally it became very difficult for the, for the government to do anything against them. So power looms really created a major problem for the organized sector. Arvind Mills would have died too were it not for a particular kind of cloth. How does it ends with jewelry for Mughal emperors end with that most ubiquitous of 21st century pieces of attire, a pair of blue jeans? Because when the Ahmedabad textile industry was going through a deep depression, Arvind Mills reinvented itself through denim and became one of a small handful of mills that survived that depression. As for the future, it looks as there's going to be a lot more denim and manufactured garments. The Lalbai family appears to have come a long, long way. I think, you know, luckily when I entered business in uh, 1977, uh, I did realize that the problems, uh, we would not be able to compete with the barroom sector. So we started looking for a new product which would be accepted, you know, the fabric should be accepted globally. It should be the new generation of fabric, which is, which is, uh, you know, everyone wants it. So when we started looking at that kind of a fabric, we came to, we narrowed down on denim. And I think we started with a very small experiment, almost three million meters of capacity. And it worked. And uh, I also bought a small uh, jeans company, which had a brand name called Flying Machines. And flying machines started selling jeans. We started making denim fabrics. And it worked to become one of the largest producers of denim in the world. Denim and uh, our business really took off from early 80s all the way to 1997, when we again faced the problem. The problem was that we had this uninterrupted kind of growth for almost 15 years. We did very well. Arvind became one of the most prominent textile mills uh, in India. And it was globally recognized as a very good mill, very good producer of denim fabrics. Uh, then we decided that we want to branch out, we want to have more fabrics, we want to get into shirtings and gabardine and knits. Uh, we did all of them. Santej is the, is the kind of new complex which we uh, planned at that point of time. And we went ahead with a thousand crores of investment in these three new areas of textiles. And uh, as things would happen in Murphy's Law, usually applies, Denim's profitability went down and we got our balance sheet leverage. So the worst period again came up and we faced a very serious threat to the survival of the company. So we had to put in a restructuring program and I think it was a very, very transparent and a very good plan. So I think all the creditors and we had 85 creditors and we had to sell it to so many people in a group and it took us almost two years to entirely thresh out the issues and and have a very, very, uh, you know, solid kind of restructuring plan put in action. And we, you know, design the whole product and we manufacture it all the way from the fiber, which is cotton, all the way to the garmenting stage.
Arvind Mills has a future that looks bright, but Sanjay's son, Puneet, is more interested in social responsibility, in this case, saving India's wildlife. I mean, if you really think about it, perhaps, but uh, there has been no pressure. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that my family has never impressed upon me that I need to behave a certain way because I am Kasur Bailalbhai's great-grandson. From as far back as I can remember, I've been deeply interested in the natural world. Perhaps some credit should go to my grandfather. Uh, when I was three and four, he used to sit down every day for two, three hours and read to me from natural history encyclopedias. That was the highlight of my day. Well, textiles also interest me, but the thing is that birds interest me more. <laughs>